Let's do the thing. All right. All right. All right, everybody. You've disabled, you've disabled screen sharing. So I'm going to put it back on when we're ready to share the screen. Okay. Um, I'll take the spotlight off of you in the meantime. How about that? I'd like to thank everybody for coming out to the um, um, July 26 uh, Homebrew Robotics Club meeting. Uh, this uh, this month, we have a very special presentation from our own Tony Pratt Canis. I'll get into the details of it later. Uh, but uh, before I do that, uh, let's see. Oh, call this meeting to order. There we go. <laughs> um, so first thing we're going to talk about is robot news. Anybody got some robot news out there they want to share? I shared something on the um, mailing list earlier. It kind of caught my eye. Uh, two things were, um, uh, one was enabling autonomous exploration in robots. And I'll just put a link in the chat here. This is a um, Carnegie Mellon group. I think I got it right. Uh, that, um, let me share my screen here. Uh, they were in the uh, DARPA challenge with the um, with the uh, uh, X Prize and so forth, and uh, they've created um, an exploration algorithm here. And I've hunted around; I haven't found it, but supposedly they'll be publishing their GitHub somewhere. So, you know, this is kind of two things um, in robotics uh, interest me, anyways. Uh, is the uh, exploration aspect of it and also the lifelong mapping. I'll put a link in the chat. But, um, you know, right now we're mapping and navigating um, and uh, that's great, but generally we save the map and navigate within the static map because if you keep a live map, it'll get messed up and things go from bad to worse. Uh, I think Slam Toolbox in ROS 2 is better than G mapping in ROS 1 and fixing itself, but regardless, uh, these are two articles I found of interest um, uh, this past uh, month, and that's uh, exploration. Um, you switch on your robot instead of driving it around with the keyboard. You, you know, it explores and create. And then lifelong mapping is the the continuous mapping, so you have continuous slam. Is there any other robot news out there anybody would like to mention? Hello. Hello. Okay. Uh, this is slightly non sequitur, but still connected. This is about planning your robot for having a human environment. Is, and, it, is this and, Mark Johnston? Yeah. I know that guy. All right. Okay. So uh, in San Francisco right now, what they did not plan for is groups of young people, mostly on weekends and evenings, uh, seeking out and finding autonomous uh, drive vehicles that are empty and placing orange cones, something that is one of our favorites, on the hood of said device and stalling the thing until someone from the company comes out and removes the orange cone. So the message here is never underestimate the uh, nature of those who want to mess with your robot. And this news piece was on, uh, I believe it was channel five uh, two days ago. That's it. Somebody call shenanigans. Do I hear shenanigans? Well, they're doing it under the guise of arguing that autonomous cars are going to ruin the world, that sort of thing. But anyway, uh, the point is, I think they're actually also out for a bit of fun, as we might say. Shenanigans. What else, robot news? I have a quick one, Cam. Toot. Um, Dan Tootler. Maker, come on, Camp. You said my name right for like two meetings in a row. Buckler. Now you're back. Thank you. Um, yeah, Maker Fair is coming back. So that was good news. Maker Fair is coming back to the Bay Area. I think it's somewhere near um, the North Bay. I forget Mare exactly Island. where. We can go. Mare, Mare Island. Mare Island. Yeah. Mare Island in October. Vallejo, two different Vallejo isn't it? Yeah, it's near Vallejo. Yeah. Near Vallejo, Mare Island. Yeah. So that's something great because we missed it. 
Yeah, I believe Marco Walthall has signed the HBRC up for um, forthcoming Maker Fair in two weekends in October. It's weird because it's going to be on two. There he is. Uh, I tried it though. So far, I haven't heard anything back. So I don't expect anything quite as soon, but yeah, at some point. I well, it, it's great. It. Usually we register at the last minute. At least you've got us registered early and tell them, <laughs> you know, we're a big club, but it's going to be two weekends and Marco's going to need some help with this. It's a lot of fun, Maker Fair, best way to see the fair. And, you know, maybe we can split it up where some show up one weekend and others show up the next weekend, something like that. But, uh, yeah, that's Maker Fair uh, 2023 uh, and uh, very exciting. Uh, participate. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think some people in the club knew about it. And some people, I was totally surprised to hear that it was back, pleasantly surprised. So that's great news. Everybody's that on the all. mailing list. That's where you get all the news. What other robot news is there out there? Oh, uh, yeah. So on the car thing, one of the problems right now that people are saying is happening in SF is the cars are doing some like annoying things, like driving down the same block over and over and over again. And also they're blocking like emergency response crews and failing to properly respond. So like to uh, emergency lights and stuff like that. So this is a great example of like, not paying attention could negatively impact the entire robotics community. What other robot news do we have out there? All right, let's move on to club news. Um, Dan Tuckler has already mentioned uh, the Maker Fair in um, um, October. Um, you can Google the dates to get them, it's, but it's two separate weekends and that'll be in Vallejo. What other club news do we have out there? All right, let's move along then to um, what I need help with. Anybody need any help with anything in particular? Speak up. We had some good work by uh, Marco Walthow again with um, the Ross discussion group I was talking to Mike Wimble, Mr. Mike about it a little earlier uh, is um, we had some obstacles on the four legs of our uh, smart table and there's a, a parameter in the LIDAR that you can get uh, to tell it what you want your minimum distance is. And so we just put that minimum distance outside of the obstacles and got rid of the, um, what it perceived as a, an obstacle uh, and so we're making some good progress there. That's the Ross discussion group on Tuesday evenings. Uh, everybody's on the mailing list. That's where you get the link to these things. Oh, um, Thomas, Thomas, are you here? Thomas is- yeah, I'm here, hello, hello. Do you wanna talk about the, um, the verbal intelligence group? Yeah, we're gonna meet tomorrow night uh, at, at uh, seven o'clock. Uh, I'll send out the- link a little bit later tonight and uh it's open forum for the most part sometimes we might have a, something to show but we welcome everyone to give us your take your um what you've been doing your questions maybe we can answer it maybe somebody else can answer it you know there's a lot of smart people who do show up there that's all tomorrow night seven o'clock this is really where the action is with the voice intelligence group and the large language models and things like that. So if you want to get on board with AI and large language models, uh, Thomas and Martin Triplett uh, really, really have a good uh, discussion group going there. So that's every other, uh, every other Tuesday, every other, what do we got? Second and fourth uh, Thursdays, right? Thank you, Thomas. The fourth. Fourth, we're not going to be doing two uh, two days a week at this point. I mean, two what days gonna, a month. Just we're, we're going to do once fourth, a month. All right, once a and month. The, the 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 information will be on the mailing list, and that's the uh, that's the big sig voice intelligence group. So we've got a weekly meeting, the Ross discussion group on Tuesdays. Uh, the big sig voice intelligence group meets last thir uh, the last Thursday, right? And um, 
then the builders right. sig the builders sig uh, meets the uh, penultimate Wednesdays. So business meeting first Wednesday. Uh, come to the business meeting. Uh, we'll rediscuss among other things where we want to put show and tell if we want to put it in front of the presentation or after the presentation. So come to the HBRC business meeting if you're interested in the business of the HBRC. Any, anything else anybody need help with? I need help with this or that? Or had some kind of breakthrough or something? I Hello, idea. Wayne, glad you could join us. Um, uh, Ted, Ted has an announcement. Shoot. I don't know who's doing this, but there's this new thing called Lost by the Bay. The uh, Silicon Valley uh, um, robotics. Okay. And everybody's Did I hear you say you? SB Robotics? No. Lost by the Bay. Lost by the Bay. Yeah, but I thought I heard SB Robotics mentioned there also. Yes. I'm, uh, well, right. And that's August, uh, August, August 4th. And it's Friday, I guess. You can look it up on the event site. There's been a post in the mailing list. There has been. Have yeah. been? Anyone been to the meetings? I think this is the first one, as far as I know. <laughs> That's Ross by the Bay. There's a link in the um, um, HBRC mailing list, uh, but. Uh, Maybe we should uh, pump that one more time. Uh, when is that uh, Ross by the Bay? August 4th. Okay, and that's a Zoom meeting. No, it's no. Not, no. Yeah, it's it does being held at Google. I think. They're not having Zoom? Pizza included. It's a what? Pizza included. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Pizza. Anything so else? Um, all right. Um, so um, without any further ado, let me introduce our uh, our speaker here. I've got- uh, Camp, Camp, I have one more announcement. Dr. Ed, go ahead. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased to announce, I'm pleased to announce that uh, now that COVID is over, Ambari is re, uh, restarting their annual open house. This is a free event and it is this Saturday. And if I can figure out how to put the link into the chat, uh, there, can you see it? Yes. Okay. Uh, so this is a family event. It starts at noon. If you're going to go, go very early because parking is very limited. If you want to see real underwater robots, this is the place to go. And it's free. It's about an hour drive from Silicon Valley down to Moss Landing. Thank you. I'm Thank you, you Dr. Ed. And if you could post a link to that uh, in the mailing list also, yes. that'd be super. Yes, I, I was going to do that after. The fantastic event. I've been to it numerous times. If you want to talk to the really robotics, the biologists, marine biologists, every it's very vertically integrated. You're going to see what cool 3D printers they have now that print centered metal. Um, it's a pretty cool event to go look at. It's uh, noon to five. <laughs> it's this Saturday, noon to five. All right. Back to our regularly scheduled programming. programming. That's right. And we're back on time. Yes, please. All right. There you go. All right. Keep them set up. So Tony Pratt Cannis. <laughs> Tony, with the presentation this evening is going to be on uh, planning and yes. um, 
planning algorithms. So Tony's going to discuss the future of planning techniques, including deep learning. Uh, he's been a 20 year uh, club member, uh, uh, an MS in computer science from Stanford. Um, I recall uh, Tony for his summer project uh, had the PR2 fetch coffee for the professor, navigate the elevators, wait in line at the uh, restaurant, give the uh, money to the clerk, and they had a little shoulder mount cup holder for the coffee, uh, carried the coffee up to the, delivered the coffee to the professor, and that was your summer project, right, Tony? Yeah, yeah. So did Tony's, uh, what was this, uh, always had um, an interest in two things, insects and robots. And this was, uh, what was this robot called? Uh, Solenopsis Solenopsis Invicta, right? Yes. <laughs> so that's one of his many robots. Him and Shiloh, of course, would be beating the heck out of us in the table bot challenge along with Rohan. This was a cool one here. Uh, at Robo Games, uh, we were given about 30 minutes to make a, um, um, a, a rope climbing robot. Uh, and we actually managed to cobble something together that went up and down the rope. Uh, didn't get a medal on that one, but uh, it was fun. There's Tony with some of his firefighting robots and his dad there. There's Tony. Tony, is, uh, it's hard to get a picture of Tony, so. I've got I've got some that I've collected over time. <laughs> there we go. There we go. That's his Robo Robo Magellan uh, robot. So, and um, one thing is uh, we've judged at um, the WRRF Western Regional Robot Forum. That's a redux of the um, first robotics and. Uh, you have to be careful when Tony gives you a high five, okay? Um, <laughs> that's all I'm saying about that. <laughs> Anyways, without any, uh, without any further ado, uh, Tony Pratt Canis and uh, the future of planning uh, for robots. Tony, go ahead and take it away. Yeah, you have to give me my screen sharing, all right. Screen sharing's enabled. All right, cool. Do we see? Yes, we do. Okay. Yeah. Hey, everyone. So welcome to my talk on planning. So, um, so what I'm going to talk about today is what I call planning-based robotics. So if you look at robotics, we have this idea of a script-based robot, like a, um, you know, a the FANUC arm there, which is an industrial manufacturing robot. And these are very, they just basically robotically follow script over and over again. They work very well for manufacturing things. Then we also have this idea that's pushed by companies like Tesla and Google of a data-driven robot that uses large amounts of data to create a generalist robot using machine learning. But we don't see a lot of deployment of this approach to robotics. Instead, we currently have this approach I call planning-based robotics, where, which is deployed at you know, 10,000 plus unit commercial scale with tasks generating revenue in real environments. And um, the reason why, where what, what's special about this is we use, we don't just use scripts. We don't use learning. We use custom clever algorithms that figure out how to control the robot and do things and offer safety critical guarantees to the user or to the robot. And this is, um, this is how most robotics works today. So I'm gonna take us through how this works in detail. So we can't have a planning talk without a plan. So I'm gonna go through the basics of automated planning theory, the history of Will Lagrange. I'm gonna show you how to apply planning to a real robot uh, using the uh, Will Lagrange system as an example, talk about the future of planning how we can apply chat GPT and large language models to planning, the implications of these results for machine learning based robotics and the future of plan ba planning based robotics. So just to give everyone some background on planning, here's a real world example of planning. We have a large map here and our goal is to drive the robot to some other location in this map. And so 
the way we do that is we use an algorithm to find the optimal route through the map. And we can actually get an algorithm that gives us both a guarantee of always producing an optimal route and efficiency guarantees that it's actually the optimal algorithm for searching this grid. So that's very nice and uh, very useful. So we are going to go back and take you back to the 70s for some old school planning theory. So planning is an academic computer science discipline. Uh, again, started in the 70s. There's, it's still ongoing today with non-robot applications such as like airplane management and warehouse management. Um, and there's a, a large academic conference every year in a different city called the International Conference on Automated Planning and Scheduling. But the roots of planning are in non-deterministic and logic programming. So what is logic programming? So this takes us a little bit back. Logic programming is the idea of a formal encoding of logical rules. So a classic example is prolog. You basically have a database of what are called predicates, like the builder, a list of builders such as Camp and Stanford, and then a list of robots such as Shaky, Pier One, Locomo, and Springy Thingy, and then also a list of who built what robot. Um, and one of the things we can do with this is get annoyed that our slides are cut off. <laughs> oh, God. Give me a moment here. Oh, it's never easy, right? Um, okay. All right, we're going to have to live with the, uh, the weird UX here because otherwise we're going to get our screen cut off. Wonderful. Just another day. Um, so, yes. okay, perfect. Um, so what we do, and one of the things about logic programming is it's non-deterministic. So when you ask for an answer, like say a robot, you actually get a list of all the robots. You don't get one robot. Non-deterministic does not mean random. It means that there's multiple answers for a question, not necessarily that we randomly choose one. Um, so prologue continued. So one of the things we can do with this, we can create some really complicated programs. So that uh, allows you to actually do pretty creative things with prologue and like automated theorem proving and all these other things that are not related to planning. Um, but one of the key things is that it's not like a programming language like C++, where each line basically gets translated into a set of CPU instructions. It's more like a building and you fill like a building drawing and you fill in the blanks by the computer fills in the blanks. And so there's no arrow of time. And instead of translating the CPU instructions, you instead uh, run what's called a solver against it. And the compute cost of this grows combinatorially as you add more rules and queries and whatnot into it. And uh, the compute cost gets really big fast because of the exponential growth of this. And, but the solver, a lot of research has been done on how to use logic rules and insights basically make the solver much smarter about how it goes about solving these problems. So it uses up a lot less CPU than it did because of all these optimizations that we're putting in salt. And we do actually have a production application of logic programming today, although a form of it that's somewhat limited, which is in databases and in the querying of databases. So one of the other things we can do with logic programming is we can do constraint satisfaction program problems, which is an extension of logic programming. Prolog does it with integers and floating point numbers in the mix as well. And then we start getting into inequality and range constraints, which can make things really complicated and algebraic constraints. And so you end up needing algebraic solvers and doing stuff with intervals. And that's important. That will come up again in the future. Trust me on this. So how 
Okay, so that's all the logic programming stuff. I'm sure we want to actually, everyone wants to get back to the robots. They're coming back, don't worry. Um, so planning is an extension of logic programming where we put time back in. And the idea of planning is that there's this concept of a domain, which describes a set of worlds. So we can have a factory domain and a warehouse domain, or a restaurant domain and a warehouse domain. And then there's logic rules and constraints that are prologue style that describe the world state. And the rules then describe a set of actions. These actions take parameters. An example of an action is move a robot to another location. The parameter would be which robot to move and the new location of the robot. Uh, and the actions have preconditions. So the robot must be charged up so it has enough battery to move or something like that. And they also have uh, resource expenditures. So the biggest resource that people usually deal with in planning is time. And they also have effects that change the world state. Like when you execute the move action, the robot in fact moves to a new location. Um, and these actions make up the steps of plans. So the end goal objective is that you specify a goal as a person for your planner to solve. And the planner generates a set of steps which make up the plan, a list of actions to achieve your given, your desired world state. And your goal Tony, is- Tony, to excuse yeah. me, when you say prologue here, are you actually talking about the programming language? I'm talking about something similar to the programming language and we'll get to that on the next slide. Yeah, so find the plan. So the, the goal of planning is to find the plan that gets you to your goal from a given start state with the least amount of resources. And in planning the goal plus the world state, the initial world state is called a problem or an instance of a planning domain. So we'll keep circling back to domains and instances of domains. So how do we encode this? And it turns out there's a standard encoding of this which is called PDDL, or Planning Domain Definition Language, which looks kind of prologue-y uh, when you look at it. So that's why I kept bringing up prologue. Um, and so the first, this example I'll take you through is called the vehicle domain. And in this domain example, you define a domain for moving cars around different cities, um, vehicles around to different locations, whatever you want them to be. And so the types are the vehicle, the location, and the fuel level. And then the predicates are, you have a vehicle that's at a given uh, location, you have vehicle's fuel level, you say that it's accessible, that the vehicle can drive from one location to the other. And then there's this planning definition is a little bit weird that the fuel levels are encoded into the, um, the instance and not the domain, but there's the rule that for any given fuel level, you go down to the next fuel level. So, which, you know, from full to half to empty, there's the next fuel level definition. And then there's only a single action, which takes a, which is called drive. It takes a vehicle, the start location and the stop location, uh, and then the fuel levels for before and after. And the precondition you can see is that we're at the start location, it's accessible. The drive location is accessible. Uh, the fuel level is the before fuel level, and the next fuel level is the after fuel level. And then the effect is basically to move the vehicle from from to two and to lower down its fuel level. And it's like this is an example of a like trivial planning domain. You can make really complicated ones with hundreds of actions and people and then put on a hundred cars and watch the planner struggle to figure it out. But we'll start with something simple that we can actually solve manually. Um, so here is the, 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 um, the, uh, the, an instance of that planning domain. So we have a truck and a car defined as vehicles. We have full, half and empty as the fuel levels. We have a bunch of cities. We say the truck is in Rome and the car is in Paris. Uh, the truck is half full, the car is completely filled up, and we have, we say that the next fuel is full to half to empty is the fuel levels. And then we define a list of accessibilities, 
And finally, we define the goal, which is to move the truck to Paris and to move the car to Rome. And the solution to this turns out to be pretty easy. It's just to move the truck directly to Paris and to move the car to Berlin and then to Rome, I believe. So this is an example. And then that's your list of actions that you hope the planner returns. So any questions on this? Okay. All right. So how do you actually solve one of these problems? And the answer in general in planning is a form of rev thirst search where what you do, so for simplicity uh, in the demo, I chose to draw this grid problem where we wanna move the blue dot to the green X and we can generate, act our actions are basically move one square at a time. We can't go through off the grid or through the red squares. Those are obstacles. And so the way breath first search works is you start at the start and then you look at idea, you know, plan candidates, which are lists of actions to expand out from the start. And so your plan candidates are, um, are here. And the first one, I chose in this one to ignore the invalid actions. So you couldn't move the blue dot to the left because it's off the grid or to the right in the initial scenario because you hit an obstacle. So the first, uh, way to go is you can go upwards and then you can also go downwards. And those are your two plan candidates that you have. And when you say breath first search, what you do is you pick the plan candidate with the lowest resource utilization. So if you have a plan candidate that has zero plans, that's the, obviously the first plan candidate because there's zero resource usage. In this example, we're saying every move uses up one resource unit. So you just are picking the one with the shortest number of moves. Wait, yes? Okay, so uh, you said, I don't want to move into the red. I can't move the red and I can't move out of the grid. However, those really, if you had a completely arbitrary grid, those would be possible candidates. So yes. you don't actually generate them and then check against them and say, oh, sorry, I can't. Yes, move. you do, you do. Oh, okay, so you you're have to do that. after that. Yeah, I stripped those out because otherwise this would yeah, get yeah, really big right. and wouldn't fit on the slide. But yes, you're absolutely right. That's absolutely how it works. We have to generate a lot of like candidates that are dead because yeah. there's an in, they're completely invalid and you just don't explore them. Thank you. But yeah, you have to try everything. So what you do is you go left and left here is up and then right here is down. And then we have four more. We now can expand two more for each candidate. And that gets you four candidates for the for this row. So you go and we have one up here. And this one's actually a loop. This one is also a loop where you go back to the start. These ones continue on. And then you go one more row. And then, oh, we have a success. We have backwards, a couple loop ones, backwards, et cetera, et cetera. And then we also have one that made it all the way down to the other side here of the so if the green dot had been here, we would have gotten there in this track, but that's not where the goal was. So this is how planning algorithms basically work. Um, they have to be expanded. There's a lot of tricks that you use to simplify them and, and do things, but this is how they basically work. Is there any particular reason why you chose breadth first? So depth first, so yes. So it depends on your planning problem. If your planning problem, uh, breath first tends to be more efficient because you catch the, um, you catch the goal. The uh, if especially if you have a system where the goal is likely to be found, and let's say that the maximum plan length is two to three times the size of the goal, the amount of steps it takes to get to the goal then you could do a lot more searching with depth first search than breadth first search. Because you know, you're searching this downward, expanding outward, and then, oh, you found a thing and you can stop. I, I don't want to get ahead of you, but are you going through all of the permutations before you then determine the most efficient route? So the thing is that's interesting, yeah, so we'll cover that in a minute, but the thing that's interesting is that with breadth first search, the first, depending on how, whether your actions, 
if your actions can only, if you have a, all of your actions take the same number of resources, the first one you find is one of the optimal racks. Because if you have a six, there's, there can be multiple optimal routes, but since you're always looking at the lowest resource plan first, the one you find is always going to be the first one. If all actions take the same amount of resources. If actions take different amount of resources, when you find one, you have to keep searching up until you find, you can drop anybody who goes over or has the same amount of resource usage as the first one you found. You've got to do some backfill if you actually want the optimal plan, but you're going to get close to optimal anyway. The, in planning, there's usually a set of optimal plans, so it's not like one optimal plan. This example, there's only one optimal plan. I think about this in game theory, you would normally order these by some evaluation of the, how close does this come to achieve the goal? And you would always choose the order and select the one that gets you close to, to the goal rather than minimizing resources. Yeah, so that's a heuristic planner. Uh, that's called having a heuristic in the loop to try to sort them by the heuristic. You can do that too. The thing is that this approach that a lot of this is about guaranteeing optimal plans and et cetera. Um, and you're still gonna have to backfill to guarantee optimal plans. Once you find the first success, you're gonna have to backfill uh, all the other plans to see if there's somebody more optimal. So if you do that, so that's why it's done this way. Uh, this is for strict optimal planning. You're still not going to do presumably an exhaustive search. Yeah, so you, you don't actually need to do an exhaustive search with breath first search because when you're basically doing an exhaustive search up to the success point. So you're uh, assuming the first success will be the optimal success. You can make that assumption because of the way breath first search works. If, with the caveat that you have to backfill if you have varying resource consumption per action. Okay. But yeah, it makes sense. You, once you see it, it's, it makes sense. Yeah. So the tree search gets big fast. So this is the problem with this is that the tree gets big fast. So there are A to the N, there are A to the N steps where A is the number of actions and N is the number of possible steps. So a very naive grid search on a 20 by 20 board, not a very big board as far as robotics is concerned, can be like 10 to the 240 of steps. So you can get big fast. So how do we trim? We got to pull out the garden and shears and trim the tree. So how do we trim our, our tree here? Well, the zero thing is we stopped. We just had this discussion about not considering additional stuff after we find a successful plan. That, that's a good one. The other one is also stop considering invalid actions. I mean, one invalid action sinks the entire plan, so it's not worth considering any plan with an invalid action. But the really, really good one is to drop all the looping states out. And so loops are the biggest cause of loss here. And um, a looping plan, in a grid search example, a looping plan can never be the optimal plan because it's easy to prove this by contradiction. If a looping plan is optimal, you could make it better by just taking the loop out. It so you normally just create a signature of every loop and then store everyone and say, have I seen this before? Yeah, so that's, yeah. So looping, there's several, there's two different ways to get rid of loops. The first is to look at the history of your plan and then say, oh, I went to the same place. I can drop that. But that's not actually as good as getting as getting rid of all duplicate states. And the best is when you get to a state, you say, okay, I found the shortest, I look at, I have a, a cache of states basically. When I get to a state, I say, okay, is the path that, okay, the state's already been seen before, no need to explore. And one of the tricks you can do that's even better is you can look at that state and say, what was the resource usage to get to the state previously? And if I'm under that resource usage, I say, okay, this plan, this new plan I've generated is the way to get to that state. And depending on how your resource usage is done, that may come up. Yeah, that... Yeah, that's kind of the right intuition. It's a little more complex when you actually get into something like a 
So like there's Dijkstra and A star search and all that. And those are the algorithms that really do it for 2D for grid search. But that's really what we're talking about here is that. So like marking it as an obstacle is kind of. Okay. Yeah, but yeah, there's more state than just an obstacle and not an obstacle. So like, yeah. So one thing is that this can reduce our grid search to like four times the uh, number of cells on the grid plus and the number of cells in the grid times the log of the number of cells in the grid, which is not all that bad. It, we went from like 10 to the 240th to like 400 or like a thousand. That's a pretty good speed up by using these pruning techniques. So questions? Okay. So how do we apply this to a real robot? So first of all, one of the things is that planning really only considers generating the plan. Planning theory just does that. Generating the PDL left as an exercise the reader. Translating the human input to the goal is also left as an exercise to a reader. Generally, relatively easy. If you have some GUI or something, the person clicks the button and that generates the PDL goal. Um, translating the sensor inputs to the PDBL state gets to be non-trivial, and we'll see examples of that. And the other problem is also executing it is not entirely easy. Um, and the plan is executing each step is just assumed to be successful in planning. It's like, here's your plan. Your robot works 100% of the time, so we don't need to deal with failures. But the reality is that actions can fail, and then we have to replan. And plan repair, there's also this concept of plan repair, which is to patch the plan by using the existing plan to succeed. So example of this that happens is like your door opener failed because the door was already open. So the replanning step is to say, oh, don't run the door opener, just drive through the open door. And we don't need to regenerate this massive plan and potentially use up a lot of resources to do that. And there's also specialized algorithms for certain planning domains, and we just don't do PDBL. Theoretically, PDBL can encode almost any planning domain we can throw at it, but it might be more efficient to just drop it for some of these domains. And we'll see that when we talk about real systems. So quick Willow Garage history. Willow Garage was, so we're gonna use Willow Garage as an example of how this will apply to a real robot. Because right now we just have like a bunch of abstract stuff. So Willow Garage was a large 60 plus uh, person privately funded robotics lab. And it was a lot of fun until we ran out of money. Uh, and there were many direct and indirect spin out companies from this uh, that are running around today. Uh, and we created Ross V1 there and the PR2 personal robot. This was entirely a planning-based system. And we did a lot of stuff like beverage fe fetching, playing pool, billiards, uh, shirt folding, and tabletop object manipulation. And we ran a full marathon driving indoors throughout the building without human intervention for the entire thing. We also had the robot open doors and it would plug itself into the wall to recharge. And uh, also the robot was capable of buying coffee and making coffee at one point with like a um, coffee maker and like getting stuff out of the fridge and putting in the coffee maker what. So here is the PR2, our illustrious robot. It's a great robot. I miss PR2. Um, so, the arms of the robot, the, there's basically this holonomic base where the robot could do some really cool side-to-side -side moves. And that was really important for getting the planning to work really well. Um, and I think holonomic is really the way to go if we're doing indoor object manipulation. There's a, um, there's the main sensors is two LIDARs. So there's one here on the base, we call that the base LIDAR. And that did some scanning and made sure we didn't crash into anything. And also is the, the navigation. Then we had the tilt LIDAR here, which tilted up and down and generated a 3D high resolution point cloud of everything around them. That worked really great. There's also some stereo cameras in the head. Um, and of course, 
they spent like $10,000 on these cameras. And then as soon as the robot was ready to roll, the Kinect came out and blew away the cameras. So then we had to mount Kinects on all the robot's heads. Um, and uh, the arms of this robot are very nice. It can lift a lot of weight, but it's not, um, it, it can lift like a full soda can or a full juice bottle. So it's not like lifting like drywall in building your house, but it's not like nothing, but it's very human safe. So like I, uh, I ran into this numerous times. I got, you know, I, I ran the high five demo of this against my face by accident. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm still here giving this presentation. Uh -huh. So like, <laughs> um, so there is no, like, it's a very safe system. There are some pinch points, but for the most part, very safe robot. We also had a torso. The robot can go up and down, so it can like lift up and down its arms by about a foot, foot and a half. It's very nice. I miss this robot. Anyway, so the architecture of this was at the lowest level. We had ROS and controllers, and then we had mapping and localization. And then we had this world model called the cost map for the 2D plan. And then we had a similar 3D planning and perception stack. And then on top of it all, we had the task level planners, including T-Rex. And my first internship was actually working on task level planners. So this takes me back. Um, so Ross is everybody knows, I think, but Ross is a robot infrastructure tool. All sufficiently advanced robots at tonight's Ross are in basically destined to re-implement it. Uh, it's based on inter-process communication, things like transforms, managing 3D state for you, all these really nice features that you really want. Uh, but the, the robot, we also had a lot of work on controllers. And these controllers were very high performance. And so we had the base controller, which translated velocity commands to motion of base. And the arm controller, we could do a lot of really cool things with trajectories, as they were called, and things that we could give to the controller. And we could give it goals to like exert a certain amount of force on its grip or uh, you know, rotate at a certain speed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this thing had some really cool controls at the low level. And that's important for the planning that we're doing on top of it. But this, this robot was great. I, I, again, I miss it. Um, <laughs> SLAM, uh, so SLAM is the key localization technology that made all this possible. SLAM was just kind of coming along in like 08 and 09 when we did this stuff. And so the key of SLAM is that uh, we used odometry and the base LIDAR to fuse data together and make detailed maps built. And there's a manual process. There was actually exploration on automated mapping and it kind of ended up working, but we never really productionized it because there weren't enough buildings. We just make all the maps manually. Um, and we also had localization with, so once you made the map, you would then just do localization without the, the simultaneous and mapping part, just localization against the map. Robot would know where it was at all times. We also manually annotated the maps, uh, generally by typing in the coordinates of entities raw um, into the terminal. And this was to put in positions of things like plugs that the robot could plug itself into, doors, other entities the robot could interact with. And one of the other things is people ask like, why didn't you continuously update the map? And the answer is that the maps, if you continuously update them, they tend to drift. And also the building maps are basically architectural maps. Like we can have like year old maps, no problem. Like multi-year old maps, no problem. Everything was fine. So we just didn't really end up needing to update the maps. And I'm sure there's scenarios where you want to update the maps constantly, but not here. Okay, so the key world model to this is called the cost map. And the cost map is a really little clever thing that's a little tricky, so we'll go through it. So basically it's a grid map of the world. And I think the grid was like either five centimeters or two centimeters for each square. So pretty small squares. And each grid had a set of layers that define 
costs associated with driving through them. And the costs could go from blocked, can't go here at all, to free, you know, drive here as much as you want. And in between, there were regions that were considered high cost. And the reason why is when the robot had to drive through them, tend to have to slow down because it was near obstacles. We didn't want it to like crash into stuff at high speed. Um, and so at start and reset time, the cost map is reset back to the static slam. And the base scans, so we had the base laser constantly scanning away at high rate. I think it's like 30 hertz scanning, so 30 times a second scanning this data. In. But it might have been 10. Sorry. Um, I think it was 30. Anyway, the base LIDAR, LIDAR data is added to the map. Now, one thing that we wanted to do is we wanted to persist the object. We wanted to have object permanence. So when the robot turned around, if there was somebody standing behind the robot or like a chair had been rolled around, because we had a lot of rolly chairs and we were rough, somebody left a rolling chair. When the robot turned away from that chair, we'd have object permanence of the chair. So the robot wouldn't keep trying to drive back. And that avoided a lot of looping behavior where the robot would go away, forget that there was an obstacle, and then try to go back and get stuck in a loop going back. The problem with that is that it created a problem when somebody walked in front of the robot. So imagine somebody walks down like this in front of the robot. You see the little, you basically see the feet of the person appearing in the map. So you'd see this trail of feet across the map. And the problem is that the robot would then get stuck because it basically had these persistence of vision obstacles in its head on the map. They're basically in its brain, but are there. So we needed to clear out those obstacles. And the way we cleared them out was by using the LIDAR. Um, and we use this thing called ray, ray cast, ray tracing. And so one thing is when you see a LIDAR hit, you actually end up knowing two things. One, you know there's an obstacle at that pose. You know, if the LIDAR hit is 10 meters away, you know there's an obstacle 10 meters away in that direction. But you also know that there are no obstacles between you and that object that you saw. So the ray casting basically cleared out the mass. And that meant that we could persist things but not have the feet, for example, get stuck in the map because the ray casting would clear on out. So questions about ray casting? You had a, a base map. Did you clear the base map? So there was some work. I can't, I believe at one point we actually cleared objects off the base map. And one thing about the base map is some of the chairs made it into the base map and then people move the chairs some of the objects in the base map ended up not being there. So we actually did clear out the base map. In order to dissolve feet and so, uh, legs and so forth, did you use some form of uh, weighted dissolving? Uh, no, ray cast. Just, ray, it, gone. ray casting cleared it out. Yeah, so it was like, it's not so a history. It's, it's like history. lasers. No, it's lasers clearing it out. So when we see an object behind it, we know it's not there anymore and we can just blast it. I was concerned about the noise from the laser and, and then this thing really isn't gone. Oh, it's those lasers, those are like $5,000 Hakuyo lasers. Okay. There's almost no noise in them. That was so, from the LiDAR. Then, you, um, That's from, use the base LiDAR. So it's mounted like down on the, if this is the robot, it's so mounted like map, here. Map so, so what's no, the, the base way? map, yeah, the base map, the static slam map is what we call it. That's the pre-recorded one. The base, this map was built up from the base LIDAR in real time. The, 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 yeah. the ray cast, what is it doing? Is it looking at an obstacle and figuring out how much time that it's been there to determine whether or not it's permanent? There's no time. There's no time. We don't care about time. We just see another obstacle behind it, clear it out. Yeah. Anyway, I, we got to speed up because of the time check. Yeah. So yeah. we got to speed up. So we're going to get a little bit warpy here on less questions. So warp drive, engage. Okay, so the tilt LIDAR, we also had this problem of, I don't know if you can see on the map here, uh, but these little feet here, those are probably table legs. And so one of the problems is if you have a very large table, the robot would try to drive through the table because it would just see the legs and not see the top of the table. It would just bam, and crash right into the table. So what you do is you use the tilt LIDAR. 
and the tilt lidar was also included, but not persistent. And that's how we cleared out the, we dealt with the tables. So you didn't end up crashing into the tables. And the last thing of this is you had to inflate the obstacle. So the robot, again, the grid is two centimeters. The robot is much larger, it's like 50 centimeters wide. So we inflated the obstacles into, by two layers. First, we blew them up based on the radius of the robot. And then we had an inflation, a smooth gradient inflation outwards. So the robot would tend to kind of veer away from obstacles, even if that was a suboptimal plan. We also did things like starting to put people's personal space into the map so the robot wouldn't drive in front of you in like awkward ways. Now, yep, we started doing that at the end. Uh, so the nav stack here is a global and local trajectory planner. The global planner is actually a simple A star algorithm plan for the cost map, continuous replanning. The plan that you generate, very jagged. So how do you deal with that? Use a local trajectory planner to smooth out the plans. And so, and then generate and sample velocity and turn rates. Find the one that best follows the global plan, smooths out the plan. Also had to do obstacle hit verification on the world. Lastly, we had these recovery behaviors where if the robot got stuck, it would do things like try to spin around and clear out the cost map if it couldn't find its way. And then if you got absolutely stuck, we would reset the cost map, delete all the dynamic obstacles and go back to static slingly. One of the things we quickly learned is when you do that, you have to wait until you have a complete scan on all the scanners. Otherwise the robot kind of inches up to obstacles and eventually crashes into them because it doesn't see them. And it thinks that it's good to go because, hey, it doesn't see the obstacle anymore. We dropped it in the database. Okay, so a similar technology was developed for the 3D system. So we had this voxel grid, uh, which is basically a 3D grid of obstacles. And you use the LIDAR, the, the alpha cameras, there's some filtering that had to be done here because you got some spurious hits in the 3D. Um, and you also had to remove the robot from the grid because otherwise the robot would see itself as an obstacle and then it would always be an obstacle and the planner would get stuck. You also had to drop the object that is to be picked up, trying to pick up an object because the robot would see the goal object as an obstacle and get stuck. Uh, so yeah, and this is just like some of the cool 3D vision stuff that happened. We assumed the tables were flat initially, strip out the table by identifying it. It's the plane in the image scan here you can see, and then fit objects to the remaining points and then do 2D recognition to like tell the difference between a Diet Coke and a regular Coke or something like that. And it worked really well. Um, and it's the fitting uh, algorithm is actually pretty deterministic. So it's really cool. Um, then how do you detect the object? So this is like a very interesting piece of technology I don't hear talked about much, which is called GraspIt. And GraspIt did planning of graphs of objects and it used a simulation and some rules to query that simulation to detect. One of the things we had to consider was we also had to consider uh, objects near other objects. So if you have two Coke cans that are pushed up next to each other, you want to pick one, you need to make sure you pick a grass where you don't crash into the other one. And you also have to consider issues like water. So for example, if you're trying to pick up like a glass, you don't want the robot to think, well, I'll just grab it from the top. You know, I'll grab it down from the top like this because then its finger will get into the water and it won't be a good day. Um, and we had to consider dangerous objects like that. Once you did that, we then had the move it, move arm planners, which are based on projecting basically a simulation against the voxel grid, a tree of various motions applied to the arm, and then uh, doing kind of A star search there, although it's a different variant of A star, that works better for what they were doing, the high dimensional space, and then uh, pruning all the loops and obstructed states and smoothing the generated plans. And move it could do some pretty cool things. So on top of all of this were the task level planners, so, or TLPs, um, and T-Rex is one of these planners. It was a little bit more than a planner, but it, it was one of them. And T-Rex actually used NDDL and PDL internally. Some of the others did not. Uh, and the way they worked is uh, NDDL was T-Rex's specific extensions to PDL. Um, 
And the way the task level planners work is they integrated the low level planners together. And so you, and also scripted behaviors and actions. Like we had a behavior that was to make the robot tuck its arm. So just go like this. And the reason why we did that is we didn't want it to like, we don't want it driving with its arms out because then it could like crash into stuff. So we had the tucked arms action. We had some other scripted ones too, like uh, moving the head and stuff like that. So the TLPs uh, integrated all these scripted actions and behaviors as well as low level planners, like we move base, we could say like, okay, this planner might come up with something like drive to this table on the object picker, the object picker field. Okay, that means there's no objects. Drive to the kitchen, run the object picker, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually we had, we also had the goals for the TLP were provided by the humans. And eventually we got to the point there was a website where some of the TLPs could be interacted with and we kind of like give the robot tasks through the website and it would do them. And the TLPs covered tasks such as the beverage fetching and the marathon driving with the charging. So any questions? I don't want to go on like a massive tangent. But. So uh, planning based robotics today. So there's 5,000 plus bear robots operating in restaurants today using this kind of planning. Uh, there's also the savvy oaks and the simbies running around all using planning based systems. Uh, most are using variants of the Ross nav stack. Um, and we also have companies like Fetch and Canova using, still using Move It and the Move Arm stuff. Uh, unfortunately, we don't see as much use today of task level planner, but that's, I think, because a task queue for a lot of these isn't enough. So, you know, you have something that's just doing deliveries, it really doesn't need a task level planner. It can just kind of have a list of deliveries and go through. Uh, and some of the robot vacuums also use land planners like the Neos and stuff, but I don't think they use the Ross ones. They use like custom engineered ones that run on micros. So the future of planning. So one thing that's being done is probabilistic world models and exploration. So one of the issues is like, we assume that there's always a beverage in your fridge, which might not actually be true. It might be that sometimes there's a beverage in the fridge, sometimes there's one on the table, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you can do some encoding of the probability plan. Instead of there's a beverage in my fridge, there's a 60% chance of a beverage in my fridge. Then the planner can do the rest. And then you also have exploration, which is being able to handle like not knowing everything about the world because you may not and, and exploring stuff. When we actually start doing that for like automatic, do the slam stuff automatically, having the robot just kind of autonomously drive around and build up the map on its own without needing to manually drive it through the map. Uh, but it was fun to manually do the map. Um, there's also general game playing, which is a related subject. Right now, these planners, planners don't do very well in adversarial games like chess or go. They'll lose because um, they'll lose because they don't have a model of their opponent as an entity. They'll just plan for the best possible outcome and lose. Quantum computing is another subject in planning. Uh, quantum computers can provide speed ups for certain problems. Turns out that planning is, if done correctly, one of those. Uh, don't ask about this because I won't be able to tell you I'm very uncertain about quantum mechanics. Um, and so now what people really want, which is machine learning and chat GPT stuff for planning. And that's what people really wanna hear about today. So. Um, machine learning, quick review on machine learning. You have this notion of machine learning, you collect a lot of training data, which could be say images, and then you label the training data. Say the images that contain cats are labeled with one and the ones that do not contain cats are labeled with zero. And then you train an algorithm to predict the labels and you run inference on new data. Now, training is generally much slower than inference and there's a lot of techniques and a lot of math stuff for doing this, like neural networks, deep learning, et cetera. But it basically boils down to a statistical prediction at the end of it all. And uh, so this has been used in planning by using it to guide planning by saying, okay, so remember how we need to trim the tree, have heuristics to decide which plan we think is closest to the goal. We can basically learn those heuristics using machine learning by saying, is this world state likely to lead me to the goal? 
and we can say which ones are more and less likely. We can use that to kind of hopefully speed up planning. So there's a lot of research on doing that. And that's actually like a whole like topic at the conference on planning is how to use machine learning to speed up the planning. But the really interesting stuff that's happening, I'm sure for a lot of people is how to use large language models for planning. So large language models 101, if you've been living under a rock and haven't heard about chat GPT. Um, so basically what you do is you have an A, you send the AI, you have this AI system and you send it a text question, a prompt, which is some text. And then you get a response text back from it. And the text that you get is surprisingly coherent and actually quite decent in many cases as an answer. Um, there's a limit on the length of the prompts though. So you can only have so much. And the training, and you, these things are large. They're trained by using like the entire internet, all of GitHub, all of Reddit, all of like common crawl as it's called. So terabytes of data. And the training is expensive. It literally costs tens of millions of dollars to train these things. Um, just in GPU costs, not including like all the people, just in like, cloud compute costs to train these things. And uh, the way it's done is you have this machine learning model and basically the label is the next token. Let's just say next word for simplicity of the data set. And the input is basically all the previous words up to the length limit, which is say a thousand words. And that's how these things are trained. The interesting thing is these models, which are based on a machine learning, a deep learning technique called transformers is they can be Expanded also to do image as well and other modes as they're called. So you can have multimodal models as they're called. So you can do text to image, image to text. We'll talk about that more in a moment. So here's just a quick example of like how you might use chat GPT. Like you can just go online and download it if you haven't and run it. You can't actually down run it locally. You just, you're interacting with their server. But basically you just type in like create, this is just an example off their website, create a questions for my interview with a science fiction author, and then you get back a list of like questions. Mm -hmm. um, so here's an interesting problem. Can you actually just ask a large language model to solve your planning problem for you? I mean, you could just put the PDDL in and we'll talk about what happens when you do. It turns out ChatGPT can actually generate plans for you. You can ask it to create a business plan create a vacation plan. Some of these plans actually end up being okay-ish. Others, not so much. You just created a vacation plan to a hotel that just doesn't exist. ChatGPT will just make stuff up sometimes, many times. And the stuff that it makes up will sound completely plausible. It may also get certain like facts about what you search for wrong. So like it may decide like a hotel allows dogs when it doesn't allow you to bring your dog, that sort of thing. Um, and there's also a big debate on the internet about whether these systems are actually able to learn to do tasks or whether they just cleverly parrot back the training data and make people think they can do tasks. What I believe they're doing is that they're very good at translating data from one form to the other. So you can ask them to do things like, translate this text into like an academic paper and it will translate a like just casual speech text thing into something that reads like an academic paper but and it can search and pair it back to training that's what i believe these systems are doing now we can use planning theory to actually start to prove that this is what they're doing so the first and most obvious question is what happens if we just start putting BDDL plans into our, our large language model? What if we send a BDDL uh, inquiry to chat GPT and see what it does? Now we know we can send these to a classical planner and it'll just solve them. But what does it do? And so the answer is that, and we also know that it knows PDDL. We'll talk about that in a moment. It largely fails to solve the problem. It's actually one of the worst performances of any benchmark I've seen for these. I can guess why. I mean, the large language models, even with terabytes of data, it's like how many bytes out of that terabytes has it seen where it does any planning? It only predicts what it's seen in the past. 
if you've got massive amount of data of 12 characters involved in front of it, it hasn't got a lot there with it basics. Andrew, well, I think, yeah, we'd hope that it would learn it though, because it does pretty well at tasks like write a simple Python algorithm, like a cliche stack overflow Q&A problem. But it's seen a lot of those. True, but it's also seen a lot of planning. It's actually seen a lot of the planner source code for how to solve PDDL. It actually probably has the full source code to many um, like PDDL solvers that it pulled off of GitHub in it. Um, to see a lot of yeah, we'll see. Actually, I don't think it has to see very many examples to parrot one back. It seems to work with just like one example. Even. So, but here's the thing. Even the largest ones, they rerun this repeatedly with every time a new model comes out, they try and test it again. And it doesn't do that. It doesn't do very well. Sometimes it works though. But here's the thing. It does really bad if you rename the variables in the PDF. Yeah. And if you actually read the first one, they took a lot of off-the-shelf planning problems that are very, uh, there's probably a lot of solutions to them in GitHub already. So when you rename the variables, you basically confuse it because it can't just copy and paste the ones it knows. And so, of course, a classical planner doesn't care about variables. It throws them away anyway. So it just works. So it doesn't care. So it turns out that you can't, this doesn't work very well. So what happens if we deliberately, to answer your question, what happens if we take one of these things and we deliberately train it with a lot of planning examples in it? Because PDL is a little obscure. So what happens then, right? So what they did is they actually introduced a lot of planning examples of the specific domains, planning domains, remember, not just planning instances, but planning domains that they were targeting in this example. And so that actually caused it to succeed up to 90%, but it completely fails to generalize to new domains. So you put in the warehouse domain, the factory domain does great. You add the restaurant domain, sad times. But again, the related to this, the magic all depends on what the transform is. Mm, training data set, yes. Uh, I'll get to the, uh, I'll show you some more examples to show you what's going on here. So the paper says faster than classical techniques, less accurate, but unlike the planner in this had this massive GPU cluster for the thing, for the large language model, the run-ons, little bit of a cheat there. That's based on my reading of paper. Now, one of the other concepts somebody said is, okay, what if we just, large language models can't plan, but what if they could translate natural language text into planning domain definition language? Turns out they can, and they actually work really well. So you have a classical, so you translate your text into PDBL, you have your classical planner solve it, and then you translate back the little PDBL answer back into natural language text. And this turns out to work reasonably well. And basically what they did is take a classical planner and turn it into a chat GPT plugin for all you chat GPT fans. Problem is that to do this, you just have to start talking about retraining the LM to automatically detect a planning problem and engage the planner. So it does work with planning. It doesn't know PDBF, just doesn't know how to solve it. So if a pure LLM, so, I'm just five, about five minutes. Okay, it's going to go, yeah, we'll, we'll have maybe 10 minutes if I speed up here. So. A pure LLM doesn't work. What if we start, so people have this idea of taking the output of a large language model and feeding it back in. I mean, anyone who's played with ChatGPT for more than a few minutes is immediately thinking about doing that because it makes a lot of sense. So there's this idea called tree of thought, which is very similar to a classical planner. And what you do is you start saying, okay, you generate, basically you generate a series of options at each step in the plan. Then you ask it to vote on which one it thinks is best. And then you kind of loop on this. And then you have some success detector, which is either some other prompt of the large language model or an external success detector. And we can get to 70 to 70, you know, 78% success. Um, but the plan depth here is pretty short. It's only like seven layers deep at most or so, I think. And we also get a lot of help from the external success detector. So imagine you have a 99% accurate success detector. It's a really good like machine learning 
result is like 99% accuracy. You start to have the problem of like spurious success detection. You start building a large plan. You also have to figure out how to generate loops, how to deal with loops and how to detect duplicate plan states. Because you have this with the classical planner, it's very easy-ish to start detecting loop plans, duplicate states and all that. So this is our, how it works. And, you know, I like to say like larger systems, like there's a system of auto GPT kind of tends to go off into la la land as, you know, one mistake by the LLM kind of slowly blows it off course and then it's hard for it to come back. So um, you can also try to do this with PDBL, querying the plan step by step and get success. Uh, for some of the problems they used. Uh, in this example, they used basically a classical planner as a success detector. And that was one of the key things that made it work better. Um, and of course, randomizing the variable name significantly reduced performance again, suggesting to me that some of the data set, you know, the answers made it into the training data set. And so this is a very clever new approach someone said is these programs, they can generate, LMs can generate Python code. Sometimes the code that they generate even works. Um, sometimes it doesn't work out of the box. So, um, and especially true of like programs that they know very well. So like you ask you to generate a Python hello world, it'll probably work. Um, and so one of the things that this did is that they said, okay, let's use the LLM to generate a Python program to solve this specific planning domain. And remember like the planner is generic that they're competing against. So you can actually, a manually engineered planner for a specific planning domain can often beat a large, you know, an off the shelf generic planner by using like special case optimizations. So they did that and they did some things to feed it. The programs, a lot of them crashed. So they just fed back in all the errors to the LM and ask it to rewrite, you know, here's a buggy Python program, please fix it. And actually ended up working in some cases. And GBD4 ended up being much better than three in this example. And some of the programs run significantly faster than the classical planner, which is kind of cool. Um, the only thing I will say here is that their, you know, randomizing the variable names kills it again. And so I'm just like, I'm always a little skeptical that some of these examples were in the training data set, but I still think this is a pretty cool idea. You can also use this for robots. This is some SACAN, which is similar to Tree of Thought as a Google one. Um, and the idea here is that you are basically building up a list of the, um, you're basically in a given state, you have some text description of the state and the previous actions, and you have a list of possible actions as well as the goal. And you say, you ask your LLM, hey, what's the probability of this being the next action for each action? There's also another machine learning model that determines the success probability of the actions. Those are multiplied together. And then you pick the best one. And this is repeated until you give the L and you also give the LLM a chance to say, we're done. This is the last action. Works, but the success rate goes down. Of course, you get larger plants, which tends to be the case with a lot of these things. Then somebody, there's an extension of this called Inner Monologue, which is an extension of SACAN. And this uses a Socratic models approach is what they called it, where the large language models and the different models talk to each other. So imaged text basically describes the scene from cameras, which is then fed to the large language model. And then actions, it decides what actions to do. Action success and failure is fed back in. Don't worry, I think we'll post the slides. Uh, action, success, and failure is fed back into the uh, model, large language model, and there's a whole set of really clever prompting. And this is slightly higher performance than say can, um, but one of the things that they said is that it's a lot better at handling mistakes. The say can doesn't get feedback on success. So when it fails an action, it kind of learns from its mistakes in a way. But again, you know, there's a limit to this. I also believe a lot of the reason why this works is because you happen to have a lot of these um, examples again in your training data set, uh, which makes sense um, because you're just like, you're doing a lot of household stuff. And if you start having like weirdly named entities, you're gonna be thrown off course. But then again, you're trying to build a household robot. So who cares, right? Um, 
So, okay, so we have four slides. We have uh, six slides left. No, eight slides. Um, large, so one of the interesting things is large language models can be extended with other, there's a concept of end to end learning. So what if, so you know how I talked about image to text models, text to image models. What if we put a robot trajectory as an entity within a large language model or a multimodal large language model? So imagine that you had the model, including the camera's photo of the robot, the text description of the goal of the robot, and the output that it was trained on was the motion of the robot from a human to achieve that goal. And it turns out that text, uh, it turns out that these models actually can work. Um, they, uh, they basically end up removing all the logic and everything. And you just have basically the input, the machine learning and the output, nothing left. And um, there's an example, interactive language, GitHub. Uh, that one ended up, the problem is that they have a limited success rate. You top out at like 96% success. That's the absolute best I've seen. A lot of these top out at like 60 to 70%. And Tesla really likes this approach for self-driving cars. Waymo and Cruise, as far as I know, are using a planning-based system. So, okay, so this is my concern with this, is I call it a generalized no planning theorem. And so one of the problems is that if we can say that large language models can't plan without a lot of examples from the specific planning domain, suppose that also applies to multimodal models. They all can't plan. Statistical inference, not a planner, can't do it. Just pretend that's true. Okay, so now one thing we see, and I've seen this in personal experience when working with these systems, is that we had to tile the state space. So to pick up your drink here, we had to have a train example. We had to have a train example for an inch away. And the reason why is that is basically learning by rote how to handle each arm position. It wasn't learning the concept of how do I translate a drink position into a motion position for an arm. And so I did tile the state space, basically. So, you know, arm motion planning, but it can't plan. So that's my problem with end-to-end -end learning. There's also some other problems with end-to-end -end learning, like this slide here. Any thoughts? There's a pretty interesting answer here, assuming you're driving down the road, right? You just want to drive down these roads, make sure you're on the right side, right? Well, except on the one on the left, you actually want to be on the left side. On the right, you want to be on the right side because these are different countries. So if you're just looking at pixels to decide where to drive, you end up making, uh, going on the wrong side of the road and then take it. So you can't just uh, do end-to-end -end learning purely from pixels in a self-driving car. You also need to know what jurisdiction you're a minimum. So yeah. <laughs> so one of the other arguments I often hear about machine learning is that it allegedly generalizes. And so with planning, I think I've shown to you why planning is a very generalizable system. In fact, you can start to have a planning world and you can actually generalize your robot actions to all possible planning states. So the problem though is I often see a lot of people making the assumption that ML generalizes in the real. So I'd like to be more critical of that assumption moving forward. And you know, one of the problems is when we actually start saying, oh, we have a generalizable system, we have to actually start defining what we see as the boundaries of that to be able to prove that it is. Otherwise, it's an unfalsifiable claim. We have a generalized door opening robot. Really? What's your definition of a door? If I declare that the wall is a door, can it open it? No. Okay, you have, you have defined something as a door, the robot can't open it, therefore it's not a generalizable system. Once we have those definitions in place, then we can start using planning and scripting to solve, to create a generalizable system that can solve every door. So that's just that. Uh, I'll skip this for the most part, but I just wanna say that like, one of the things that I've also noticed with ML systems versus planning systems is that there's a lot of work to put in all the guardrails and the training data management and stuff for ML that's not there with planning. And we can also start to talk about certifying your planner as safety critical because we can start talking about guarantees that it provides you. And the other thing is they're also easier to understand and modify. If we wanna retrain your self-driving car, 
you know, if the law changes with a planning based one, probably just change some logic somewhere. With a machine learning based one, we're going to have to recurate the data set. So that's just something that happens. Anyway, what's the future of planning based robotics? So right now, most production planning based systems are just 2D. They don't use uh, the ARM stuff because they have no ARMs and they're too simple for task level planning. So one of the research areas that I um, was doing at Stanford that was really cool and I hope we can get back to is the idea of making task level planning easier to use. Because right now it's all PDDL, it's like a weird programming language, it's hard to learn. Like, eh. So what if we could make a drag and drop GUI interface to the planner? And I think that's the way to go. But you can also start talking about integrating your planner with an application marketplace. So your robot can kind of pick up and integrate new behaviors rapidly by using an application marketplace. And so I want to leave you with one story about planning-based robotics and Will Lagrange. This is not, um, well, from Wayne. So hi, Wayne, if you're on the chat. So Wayne, uh, Wayne always tells a story about when the internet was first coming into being. And he said, you know, there's different groups doing it, but why Tim Berners-Lee won is because he wasn't spending his time trying to solve the bi-directional links and the broken link problem. And nowadays we think broken links are a fact of life and no one wants bi-directional links, right? Well, it's not that no one wants them, but it's not killing the internet that we don't have them. But all the other groups were stuck trying to solve these problems and they thought they couldn't ship something until they did. Tim Berners-Lee just shipped. So I think that we have a lot of great things in planning based for robotics and we just need to ship them. Okay, sorry for the overtime questions. I'm kind of a fan of behavior tricks. Mm -hmm. Problem I find with what you've told me so far is that the search space for non-trivial problems is so huge. Yeah. So the nice thing about behavior trees is they're it's kind of a sequential representation. Yeah. Than a... <clears throat> so the problem with behavior trees is they tend to get kind of hard to extend. And so they're useful as like I would say behavior trees are useful within an action. And a lot of the actions, like let's say you have a door opening action that tends to end up having a behavior tree in it, implicit or explicit. But at the some level, you need to start doing the planning. Well, I actually think that you incorporate both. Right? Yeah, that's yes. All your safety systems and behavior. Exactly. So you have some low-level behavior trees that are driven by the planner. Makes total sense. But eventually, one of the things is I wouldn't worry too much about the planning because, like, with the PR2, we were doing massive grids on a. So I looked up recently the PR2 computers. If you were to get two nooks, like mid-range nooks, that would be the equivalent of the massive dual core uh, brand new top of the line server system that we used back then. Uh, um, do you mean the local leaders? No, I mean the, the Intel nooks. Oh, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> yes, I mean, it's like close to, or you could get one large nook with a memory upgrade. Yeah, you may not even need the memory upgrade. Anyway, back in the day, we had no problem running these planners on the PR2, so it didn't really get out of control. So nowadays that you have like massive cloud servers and, you know, send your planning problem to a 64 core AWS, no wait, sorry, 128 core AWS node and have it solve it instantly because it's also hyper parallelizable. I have a question. Okay. Um, you know, with the SACAN system that you talked about and the and the one after that, I forget what it was called, uh, the improved SACAN. Inner monologue. What's that? Inner monologue. Inner monologue. So I read a little bit about those. And uh, do you think those are something we could actually use in the hobby level uh, robotic? Oh, absolutely. oh, absolutely. There was um there's a lot of work on implementing these in video games. So there's a lot of work where people took these, they put them into video games. The only thing that happens is it runs up your GPT API key bill if you let it run for too long. So that's the only way. Oh, but like, you know, sticker shock of 10 million GPT queries. Uh, <laughs> but you could you could potentially use your own um, your own running language model on your yeah, large. I, I, 
yeah, I suspect that some of the like smaller, like the, the like, you know, like the 13 billion parameter, like large, like ones you can run locally would be okay for say can because yeah. you're not trying to, yeah, you're querying it. Like you're asking it a series of very short questions instead of like asking it to generate like a 40 page document, like GPT-4 or something. Great. Yeah. Rohan? Uh, so for the problem that I was talking about with like really large data, like um, search pages, uh, have you, do you know of any research that's like using ML as a heuristic? In yeah, there's a whole like conference track at ICAPS about doing repeat just- Repeat the question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, repeat the question. Uh, basically he was asking, is there a way to prune the state space using machine learning? For the planners, and there is a whole conference track at ICAPS about doing that. Tony, I want to go back to Raycast and and temporary obstacles. ACAP. Before we go back to that, does anyone have any other questions? Because the Raycast adventures could go on for centuries. <laughs> It'd be a lengthy loop. Well, just just the overall. In other words, you're <laughs> talking you're, about looping plants. You're you're <laughs> navigating, and somebody walks across, and it's not permanent. How is the robot dealing with that? And where does Raycast okay. come in there? So, so there's two ways to deal with. Okay, so there's two ways to deal with it. First of all, the tilt lidar on the PR2 was non-permanent, so those scans just kind of disappeared. Okay, so the tilt scans did disappear. And we need the tilt scans to like not drive through cables and stuff. But let's ignore the tilt scans for a moment. How does the rake have stuff work? The way the rake have stuff work is that the work is that the stuff on the floor, that the floor scans, the base scans, those are permanent. When you see an obstacle, it sticks there forever, basically, until or basically until reset of the cross net. And so the ray casting is to clear out those obstacles. And the way it works is pretend you have the robot, right? So pretend you're a robot, pretend, all right, can, I can't see, uh, I can go, wait, 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 I can go like this. Okay, good. So <laughs> we're gonna do an example. We're gonna have to do a physical example. So pretend that this is a, all right, we have the lab. You're just still highlighted, we gotta get to you. Yeah. Well. Get to me. Oh, we should get the trademark logo out. <laughs> okay. So imagine that this, the cup here, is a dynamic obstacle. Okay. So this is the my hand. Oh, can't see it. There we go. All right. See my hand here? My hand yeah. is the robot, right? So the problem right. is the cup is a dynamic obstacle. So it's a um Great, we also have ants on the table. Um, so the cup is a dynamic obstacle, okay? And suddenly the cup is taken out. So we have no cup anymore, right? But we still have like the memory of the cup in the robot's cost now. So the robot is stuck, okay? And it will keep trying to plan around the cup. But when we take out the cup, the reason why we're sensing the cup is that the base LIDAR on the robot was hitting the cup. So there were points generated by the edges of the cup. Now, the LIDAR is a line across the lab tap because the cup is gone. So now the robot has no problem seeing the lab tap. So what the robot can do in its memory is it can trace a line to each of these LIDAR hits and consider that to be a clear path and clear out all the obstacles within that region. Uh what do you call did you say there's a there's a base map the base static map and then there's okay you need to be ones. careful not to get confused between the base lidar and the base static map the base oh, static right. map is a pre-existing map the base lidar is the lidar on the robot's base there are two lidars right but yeah. i mean that there's two different levels of map being recorded right one from the base yeah. lidar and one from the base static map right 
Well, the base static map has already been recorded when we're doing navigation. Well, I mean, it, there's two points in memory of the on the computer where these maps yes. are, and one yes, is changing and one is static. Yes, they are. That is correct. Okay, but you use both of those in combination to determine occupancy. Yes, you do. Okay. Well, planner, you have multiple cost maps. Yes, multiple, multiple layers. layers of your cost layers. maps. You will put your LIDAR on one layer. If you've got a tilting LIDAR, it's on another layer. Yep. And the, the global planner usually doesn't see all of it. So it usually sees maybe just the static map. Yep. And because it's just doing a course, can I get there anyway at all? Yep. And then the local planner, the one who operates all the time really fast, he's the one that sort of oars all the maps together. He says, I'll take the, the base yep. map, I'll take your base LIDAR, I'll take the tilting LIDAR, and if anybody sees an obstacle, I'll consider that an obstacle. And uh, all those other layers besides the base map, by default in the, in the current system, until you change the configuration files, they, they, everything but the base static map says, if I don't see an obstacle, then there is no obstacle. I will clear it out of the way, mm -hmm. even though they don't say it was yep. there. I, I I just don't remember any of this in the, I, I you know the Ross one training I did or Ross two tutorials. It's there. I can there. I can send you the code. Uh, it's there. Yeah, maybe I skipped over or something, but that's really nice to know. I remember debugging it way back in the day. So what is fun to me is we got this stuff already done. You know, we didn't have to invent it. Exactly. And particularly uh, the, the Ross control system still isn't used in a lot of places. Yeah, neither is the ARM stuff. Right. Um, the ARM stuff is the really cool stuff we've not gotten a chance to use yet. And the ARM stuff is pretty interesting. Once you start seeing the robot like pick and place objects with high reliability, it's magical. But you can use that today, right? Still, if you make a robot yeah, yeah it's or... still maintained like there's a whole team maintaining it and it's apparently used by fetch so mm. all right thank you very much tony pratt canis ladies and gentlemen Yay. can you put the camera back up tony uh yeah i can you want to yeah here uh thank here. you very oh. much that was a wonderful presentation uh, and we'll get the um, slide deck up in our uh, um, uh, meeting um, um, history page. Um, so we've, we've moved the uh, show and tell to the end of our um, presentation. So uh, I'd like to open the show and tell um, component of this uh, evening's meeting. Does anybody there on site at Sunnyvale have a robot for show and tell? No, no. Yeah, that's a negative. Okay. Uh, online, show and tell anybody. Anybody want to show what they're working on? Heavy on the show, light on the tell, limit to five minutes per demonstration. <laughs> I'm going to show something. This is from our um, Ross discussion group. And uh, this is the. Uh, this is the uh, the smart table uh, that we're building up from the Lino robot. I wished I'd taken images of the um, um, the the um, Arvis, the Ross visualizer, because we were getting um, lidar scans on each of the four legs, and again working with uh, Marco Walthal um, and Mike, Mr. Mike helped out with this stuff too. Um, we, we, we discovered that there's a way to set the minimum reading of the LIDAR so that it doesn't detect the legs as obstacles uh, and uh, good stuff in the Ross discussion group. Who else has a show and tell this evening? Something they want to show that they're working on. All right, well, that didn't take five minutes. Um, if, uh, if there are, are no other show and tell or comments or questions, uh, I'll make a, me a motion that this uh, meeting be adjourned and we move to uh, random access. So a motion that uh, we end this meeting. Do I have a second?
Two. Second. 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 All in favor, say aye. 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 Those aye. opposed, say nay. Nay. Oh, I didn't say nay. <laughs> the ayes have it. Meeting adjourned. Uh, all right. Bender. So one last minute thing. We have a ton of stuff here in the Zoom. Um, we have OSERF and Willow Garage still. So please take the or not Willow Garage, the logic. So please take the stuff. <laughs> but some of the stuff is probably Willow Garage stuff from OSER. So <laughs> take is the stuff. Rohan, is that Rohan I see back there? Uh, <laughs> Come up here and say hi, Rohan. <laughs> hey, buddy, how you doing? Yeah, how are you, Camp? Uh, doing okay. You're in Indiana now, right? Uh, Illinois. I can't, but, I can't see your face there. Uh, Illinois. How's school going? Good. Uh, going for a master's. Going to be done soon. Very good. Uh, what, computer science? Uh, computer engineering, yeah. Good for you, man. Proud of you. Proud of you guys. You and Shiloh and Tony. <laughs> knew all you guys when you were in elementary school it seems like hey yeah, pretty much Raphael how you doing I'm quite good. <laughs> there you are I'm over here dude <laughs> Should, should I take some down or should I put some in? <laughs> Show us how, what kind of hardware they're giving away. Well, <laughs> what kind of hardware are they giving away? Now we're on the road. You can almost see. See there? That's why you go to the meetings. I remember the uh, PR too. Something on top of like uh, Tony, like Tony was saying, they had these thousand dollar stereo cameras uh, that they didn't use, and they they literally duct tape a connect on the top of the PR two. It was awesome. Looks the same. Jeremy, how you doing? Uh, uh, my uh, mics works, but yeah, doing great. Good to see you. Amazing meeting. Where, where are you at? You in Texas? Where are you at, Jeremy? Uh, I'm up in Canada still. Canada. Yeah. Hey, all right. Up there yeah, was so in Toronto. <laughs> in Toronto. Very good. Hey, Stephen, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. Working, working. Very good. Taking what they're giving because you're working for a living? Something like that. Yeah. Hey, BB, how are you doing? Oh, so it's for left That's Ralph Campbell, I believe. One of the Ralphs. Hey, uh, I can hear you, Mike Wimble. How many how many people were at the physical meeting? Ten or twelve? Uh, probably twenty or so. Okay. We had about twenty eight. We had about twenty eight people online, so pretty good turnout. Yeah, Next month's going to be in orbit. I'm trying to think of the guy's name, Florina something, but uh, he does like multi robot programming, that sort of thing. So the funniest thing about Tony Prakkanis, and I was trying to go there with my little slideshow, but we were at the WRRF, which is the first redo, and there was um, there's a thing where the teams that win come come past all the judges 
and everybody's everybody's giving everybody a high five, right? They're slapping five as they go by. Wow. And Tony, he got tickled and started laughing, and he was giving a high five because the kids were coming across and hit them in the face. And we were all laughing so much. He hit the second and third kid. And uh, was trying to give him high fives. It was hilarious. He had to be there. I like to tease him about that whenever I whenever I can. Jeremy, you go to you go to Chaz's meeting sometimes, right? Yes, yes. Okay. He's got the uh, Lino robot in uh, Fortress now. I mean, he's gone through all kinds of gyrations. I'll let him figure it out. I, I'm still doing it in class, but he's managed to get the Lino robot into Fortress. Yeah, he was, last time I, I spoke to him, he was like down in two files to uh, figure out. And uh, it's it's good to hear that he's he solved that. Um, well, he went to RossCon with France, in yeah, France, and yeah, uh, let's see if I can find it here. He uh, he managed to get a picture of himself with Steve um, McKinsey. Oh, wow. Uh, let's see if I can find the picture. Yeah, no, he was he was quite the sleuth, figuring yeah. out the different versions and stuff. I was uh, quite quite impressed. Well, I like I, I'm I'm steering clear of it. I'm just you know happy that the uh, the GitHub stuff works. Let's see here. I showed his picture. we lost um that's okay we're still online we're still doing random access until they uh till the security comes and kicks us all out of the um kicks us um out of the uh, uh parking lot Let's see, I'm trying to find that picture of uh, um, Chazzy Man and uh, Steve Mack. Uh, it's around here somewhere. All right. I've been racing my RC car lately, too. That's fun. Oh, yeah? Yeah, we've got an RC car track. Uh, can't be more than 10 minutes away. And uh, it's uh, that's a good thing to do along with the um, um, robots. Uh, <clears throat> Does it have a first person camera or you just do it watching it remotely? We, we stand up on a uh, uh, there's a big uh, tower, like a two foot tower that we stand on and um, race from there. Uh, you know, it's radio control cars, obviously. Um, yeah. Well, you know how the drones have the FPV and I've come really close to buying one of those, but I'm still holding off. They're getting better and better. But yeah, those um, are the strangest things when you see one of those like hovering, um, you know, it's really it, it's almost like it's out of uh, um, a CGI or something, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, those little I forget what they call them, the little ones that uh i think Cine they have whoops. what's that cine whoops yeah 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 yep the cine whoops are that where you can they're kind of protected propellers and they're they're just built for speed but also and maneuverability but also being around things they might bump into and uh and then you you fly them you know first person 
and that's got to be interesting. Well, it's um, they're so quiet, and and again, when you just put them in a position and they hover there, it's like you look past them. You don't even see them because you don't expect to see anything there. Yeah. Um, and um, like I say, it looks like a CGI artifact. But one time, this guy had his drone out at the RC car track, and was flying his drone around. And you know, a little bit later, he was up on the second floor of this um, RC speed, the uh, RC um, RC speedway. And uh, one of the guys asking says, uh, um, uh, "Hey, Jamie, where's your drone?" He's like, "Oh my God, he left it hovering above the train," <laughs> and he was scrambling to get his transmitter because it was running out of power. He's afraid it will drop down at the top of the tree. But, so every time I see him now, I'm like, hey, Jamie, where's your drone? <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, it's I, think, well, I think, well, the more sophisticated ones, when they run low on power or they get disconnected, they'll just land, right? They'll well, go back to that's the, the problem point. is if this thing lands, it's going to come down on top of that tree. I don't know. Maybe yeah. it can look and determine that it shouldn't be on top of the tree. But it was hilarious. Uh, Bert's like, "Hey, Jamie, yeah. where's your drone?" He's like, "Oh, wait a minute. He left it. He left it hovering." <laughs> Some of them have obstacle avoidance, and as that gets better, it'll be really interesting. Well, drones, and I'm stating the obvious. It's I'm going to stop this um, uh, re recording now. Stop the, stopping the recording. <laughs>